Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for the honor and the pleasure to speak here today. I would actually like to uh, start my presentation with a brief changed quote from a famous Englishman, Winston Churchill. What he said about the Americans seems to be a little bit of truth about the Europeans at this moment. And he said about the Americans, you can always rely on them to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. And it looks like when you, when you, when you look at the consecutive uh, conferences to save Greece and to save the Euro and to end the crisis, that everything is being tried, uh, but we are not yet there. We are not yet there at the right thing. And the second quote from Winston Churchill is, however beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. And that's what I'm going to try today and uh, give you a little bit of an overview of why we think that uh, um, an adjustment, a little change of course uh, of this ship uh, might be a good idea for both Greece and Europe uh, in the sense that there could be created a win-win game, how to save Greece um, at much, much, much lower cost to the European taxpayer and at much lower risk to everybody involved. Now, most of you have heard about Eureka. Um, I think the Greek press has been quite uh, kind to us in the sense that there was a lot of uh, presentation in the public, uh, in the media, in the TV, um, and in so far I will try to keep this very focused. Um, and I will try to also put that in relation to the results that came out of the Brussels meeting only a few days ago um, and give you uh, some uh, idea what, what we believe uh, will develop next year. Now, we have seen that uh, there is a voluntary haircut as, a, as one of the big so-called progresses of this program. Actually, as many of you know, I have been speaking against this haircut in the public. Um, and uh, the reason for that was that we do see a lot of risks. We do see a lot of... Uh, risks in the legal fine print, especially when it comes to legal liabilities of bank CEOs agreeing to such a haircut, given the situation that there was a guarantee on 80% only three months ago and effectively a guarantee on 100% only a year ago until 2013 by the Europeans. Now, this, this makes it very, very difficult to speak about a voluntary haircut. Um, uh, a friend of mine said to me, if I'm entering a bank with a gun and say, give your money to me voluntarily, will I, will I walk free if I use the word voluntarily? Um, probably not, and that is, that is all, of the, all of the conundrum that, that this uh, haircut discussion is in. Now, the haircut discussion itself is only part of this. The second part of it, and, and I believe that this is the reason why Mr. Papandreou went out to say we have to have a referendum on this, is that the projections of the debt ratio of the country, even under this new deal, are not really attractive. It's 120% in 2020, and maybe 100% sometime, something like five to 10 years later, but only on the assumption that you're running a 4% primary surplus year over year in every budget. Uh, is anyone here in this room who thinks that's realistic? Is anyone here in this room who thinks that 120% by 2020 is an attractive proposition, knowing that you have to go below 100% to get access to the markets again, given the history, given the economic history? Um, that would mean that the country is under the tutelage of its European friends for 10, 15, maybe 20 years. It will be very, very difficult to sell this to the public. So we believe that it will also be necessary to think about if this is really the best deal for both sides. Is it the best deal for Greece and is it the best deal for the Europeans? I dare to put some doubts on that. Um, from a bank's perspective and from the question of what banks have now to do, um, I would like to pick up on the, on the motto of this conference, uh, how to get out of the eye of the cyclone. It's actually not that you can get out of the eye of the cyclone, you have to manage the cyclone. You have to be part of the discussion, you have to be part of the game in such a way that the way this cyclone behaves is also subject to what you do. And how that could be done, I would also to put a few thoughts into. Now, we believe that Greece needs a more macroeconomically sound approach. Uh, we, need, we think that Greece needs an approach that reduces debt much quicker, much farther, and that also combines this debt reduction with a growth program. Growth and jobs is what can be sold to the people in this country. If you come up with a program that creates both, you will get the approval not only of the industry, of the banking industry, of uh, the non-financial service industry, you'll also get the approval of the men on the street. And that's why we also advocate to come up with something that creates that growth 
and we also have an idea how to do that. So what is Eureka? Eureka, put very simply, is to say, we do a privatization program, but we redesign it. Uh, we do a more comprehensive privatization program. We put all state assets except a negative list that would include the cultural heritage sites, uh, security-related items, etc., into a very large holding. And that holding would, under the original Eureka program, be sold to a European Union institution for 125 billion. Now, we have been asked many times the question, why do you come up with 125 billion? Do you know that it's 125 billion? Do you have, do you have any better information why, why you say our assets are exactly valued at 125 billion and not 50 and not 500? And the answer is no. The answer is, we do not know better what the total value of those assets is. 125 billion is the number that you need to lift the country out of the debt trap. And then you structure the whole transaction in such a way that the 125 billion A can be reached. And if you do not reach it exactly, that a deviation from that can be managed. That's, that's risk management in effect. If there's a surplus, you pay it out to Greece. And if there is a deficit, you also have to have an idea how to handle that. Now, the 125 billion goes to Greece only for one logical second in our plan, and is then used to repay 65 billion to the European Union member states and the, and the IMF, uh, so to reduce debt by 65 billion in that step, and then to give a loan to the EFSF. Paradoxically, Greece would give a loan to the EFSF, and the EFSF would then do a buyback program, 40 billion, uh, 40 billion market value um, bonds from the ECB, uh, which is a nominal value of about 55 to 60 billion, and the other uh, 20 billion would be used um, on further buybacks from the market. So you would end up in the EFSF with a balance sheet that has a loan from Greece for 60 billion and a loan to Greece with a mark to market value of 60 billion and with a nominal value of probably something around 90 to 100 billion. Now that reduces debt by 125 billion in one step. That is actually a bigger step, a much bigger step than the haircut. Uh, especially in the light that it happens at once. It doesn't happen over 10 years distributed. It happens at once and it reduces the debt burden by almost 40% in one step. And also it reduces the interest burden by almost 40% in one step. Then the second part of Eureka comes in. And the second part is now that these assets have changed hands, they are restructured. They are basically put into a condition whereby they are more valuable, where they are more profitable. Restructuring investments in the size of 35 billion is what we propose here. That would be fresh money. But when you look at the total number, 15 billion out of that would come from the EU infrastructure funds. So the fresh money that is needed is 125 plus 20. So that's 145, and that's still one third less than the rescue program one and two, which you wouldn't need anymore if you run Eureka. So you're saving about one third of the money, but you're just investing it in a different way. Now, this, four, this 35 billion investment in these assets, you can compare this if you buy a house, you renovate it, and you sell it. So by buying it and renovating it and selling it then, you get more money than you just spent on the, on the purchase and the renovation. That's, that's the basic, simple idea behind it. That's how restructuring works. Um, actually, as a company, we do have a lot of experience with restructuring, and that's why we know that if you have a large, diversified portfolio, and a good idea how to use restructuring, you will get much more than one euro value out of one euro invested. And that means we can get a much higher privatization value, the surplus of which can then again go to Greece. Now, if we do that, not only will we be able to reach that target of 125 billion or more, we'll also have a stimulus program for the Greek economy because these assets, although they would have been bought by the European Union institution, are still located in Greece and any investment that takes place on them will lead to investment demand in this country. 35 billion spent over two to four years is a stimulus program of 15% of GDP. That is comparable as if Germany would run a 400 billion stimulus program on its economy. 15% is relatively big and it would kickstart the Greek economy, it would stop the vicious circle of saving this country to death. Because what we observe now is that by saving more and by being more austere, although that may be um, a good thing in itself, by, as in an isolated perspective, uh, the economy has been shrinking faster. Uh, the tax revenues have been shrinking faster and the gap has only become faster. Um, one and a half years ago, the projection of growth for 2011 was positive. Uh, now we see that it's minus 6%. Uh, today, people say, if we are just going on with the austerity program, 2012, we'll have less negative growth, and maybe 2013, we'll see growth. Actually, personally, I don't believe that. As long as you continue to shrink the economy by an austerity program that is basically exercised within a debt trap, 
the, econ the economy will not save itself out of that debt trap. That's why it's called a trap. Uh, debt trap, by definition, is something that you can save yourself out. Uh, you can only do that once you are close to the level that is sustainable. So you need to reach a sustainable level first, and that's what you can either do with a haircut or with something like Eureka. And um, the problems of the haircut we've already elaborated on. Now, uh, what would that mean after this, after this program is done? Greek, Greece's economy would grow. There would be a short-term stimulus program from the investment, and there would be a long-term stimulus program from the supply side. Because privatizing on this scale will make the economy much more efficient, much more productive, and this supply side shock will set in after two to four years, and it will last for many years. So there will be an above average gross rate achievable in this country. Now the above average gross rate, we haven't factored that in. We have assumed that it's only 2% over the next 15 years with a 2% inflation rate over 15 years. And then we also have assumed a 1% surplus in the budget per year, 1% of GDP in the, in the fiscal budget per year over 15 years, which is a much more realistic assumption than what you've seen in the latest reports from the Troika. Now if you do that, you end up with under 40% debt over GDP in 2026. And even if you assume that there is a shortfall in the privatization revenues that then Greece would have to cover, maybe of 25 or 30 billion plus interest, then it would be easy for Greece to cover that. So we have a lot of risk mitigation in there. And also when you look at what is the FSF doing with the money, the buyback program, getting 90 to 100 billion nominal value in there for 60 billion money spent from this loan that Greece is giving to the FSF, would also lead to a situation where you have 25 to 30 billion risk buffer that can be used as a compensation for the European taxpayer in case there is a shortfall of that size in the, in the privatization revenues. So you can effectively easily go to a privatization revenue level of 70, 75 or 65 billion without a huge cost or without any risk for the European taxpayer. Now what does that mean? We have a construct here that effectively leverages Greece's wealth and Greece's uh, assets in such a way that it reduces the risk on both sides. And if you ask me, is this country bankrupt? The answer for this reason is no, this country is not bankrupt because it has a balance sheet that is much bigger than most people think. And even under the most pessimistic assumptions, it is not necessary to say we are just uh, assuming these assets away. If these assets are used productively, if they are put into use creatively, they can effectively be the tool that gets this country out of the crisis, immediately, more or less, and that reduces the risk to the European taxpayer by 90%. Because all the credit risk that the European taxpayer is running under the rescue schemes one and two is adding up to 220 billion if it's all paid out, with almost the assurance that the country will go bankrupt because it is not sustainable. Even after the haircut, one might question the sustainability of the debt level. So if you know that there is a default in waiting, that means that this very, very large exposure will at some point lead to payments. Now, in the case of Eureka, you still have a risk, but it's an asset valuation risk and it's much, much smaller. Um, we had a lot of discussions recently and one of the main concerns on the political side in this country was, can this be done, can this be sold to the Greek public to sell everything to a European institution? And for this, reasons we've, for this reason, we've come up with um, a change in the construction of Eureka that achieves, achieves, achieves economically the same thing, but that doesn't include a sale of all these assets to the European institutions, but rather creates a collateral pool and privatization agency that is owned by the Greek state, but that is not guaranteed by the Greek state. So the asset holding would effectively sold to that collateral pool and privatization agency, and then this asset holding would pledge all these assets in an asset back deal to Europe and get a 125 billion loan, plus it would receive a management contract. So the, the Greek-owned institution would be managed by the Europeans in return for this asset-backed uh, um, uh, loan deal. So that effectively achieves the same thing economically, but it excludes the option to sell everything out of the country. These assets only leave Greek state ownership once at this moment when they are privatized, but the organization of the privatization is still very much um, controlled by the Europeans, but would also include Greek technocrats, which we think is also an important matter. Now, uh, this change of, uh, of Eureka effectively is more kind of owed to the political discussion than to the economic discussion, but we believe it would just as well work. 
uh, a few more words about sustainability. If you look at the market uh, situation, then what you can say, if, if, the, if the perception of the markets once is that the country is in a debt trap, um, that is somewhere between 100 and 120, 125 percent, sometimes 130 percent, depending on macroeconomic uh, data around it, like savings rate, like uh, trade balance, etc. But once you are perceived as being in there, you have to get back below 100 percent to be safely out of it. And that's why we believe that what is necessary for Greece is a combination of what has been decided in Brussels and what Eureka has on offer. Uh, we believe that if Eureka is implemented, the debt could be reduced to just under 100%, and if it's combined with a smaller haircut, like the one that was approved on July 21st, the debt would end up at 82% of GDP. Um, that would be a relatively quick way to end the debt trap for this country. It could, in theory, be implemented before the year is over. Now, every month that we wait costs us more money as an economy. When we did this calculation first in May, June, <clears throat> the numbers were 145% uh, debt or 140% debt over GDP, and Eureka alone was able to lower that to 88%. Now, <clears throat> four months have been passing by, the economy has been shrinking, the debt has been growing, the gap has been widening, and the longer we wait, the more difficult it will be to get where we want to get. So every month that we wait will cost a lot of money for the future wealth of this country and also for the risk of the, that the Europeans have to take to save it. How would this seamless program look like? When you look at the total size of the economy, it's currently 225 billion per year. Uh, there are projections about saying about 220 billion. It's, it's difficult to, to get exact numbers at this point in time. Uh, so sometimes they, they, they change on a daily basis and depending on which paper you're reading. Uh, and 35 billion investment would be 15% of GDP. We do not assume a multiplier effect, although we believe that there would be a very large multiplier effect from these investments. So the impact on the economy would be more than these 15% uh, of GDP. We believe that it would be one and a half to two times that size, but we have not included those numbers in our projections because we wanted to be conservative. So what we think is that given the condition that the country is in, uh, having an operational level way below its capacity, way below its capacity limit, and also having an economy that has been shrinking for the third consecutive year because of lack of demand, uh, we think that uh, a pure investment demand stimulus program will yield more than uh, a multiplier of one, uh, rather one of two. Um, when you then look at the structural improvements in the economy that are triggered by the privatization, we think that the long-term growth rate can be increased by one to one and a half percent per year over many years in the future. Uh, if you just assume for the moment, uh, there, are, there are numbers that the total value of the assets is between 75 and 300 billion. Now, if you assume, for example, it's 150, uh, these assets effectively do not create a lot of return for the country because if they would, the country would not be um, in the situation that it doesn't have enough money to repay its debt. Now, getting these assets into a productive shape would at least bring them up to a yield of 10% pre-tax per year. That would be another 15, maybe 20 billion additional GDP per year just from making these assets productive. When we come to the question of the privatization scheme, I know that there has been a very, very controversial discussion in the press, um, especially with regards to why do we believe that we know it better than, than for example, the Greek privatization agency. Actually, we do not. Uh, but we, we do know a few things about valuation and about the prices that you achieve depending on how you privatize. And there are effectively three main levers that we think can be drawn that are not drawn in the current program. That's not the country's fault. It's more the fault of European partners because they've been forcing the country into this privatization scheme under pressure. Um, and those three elements are, first of all, timing. You don't privatize in a recession if you want to get the full intrinsic value. Look at the Athens... Uh, uh, stock index uh, on this page. Um, it is about 10% of what it was three years ago. It is about just under 20% of the average it, that it had the last five to 10 years. Uh, if you privatize in such an environment, that means those are the prices that you are getting. It's just not a, a smart idea to privatize in the middle of the recession. Even if you need the money, you have to come up with something more creative. Secondly, time. If you want to sell fast, you have to have time. 
Selling fast means you are selling under pressure, means that the type of investors that you are attracting are the type of investors that are out for the bargain. Um, and given the situation, the macroeconomic situation of the country, that compounds the effect. So if you, are, uh, if you buy a house and you're in financial difficulties and you have to do a fire sale, you'll never get the market price. You'd usually get a third less. That's why banks, for example, when they give a loan on a house, subtract from the market value some margin to say, okay, we need the safety that in case of a fire sale, we still get back our money. And the third element is profitability. Many of these assets are simply not profitable, but they could be made profitably easily with a restructuring investment that is focused. Um, all three elements are missing in the current program, and they are not missing because Greece couldn't do it better. They, they are missing because the circumstances has, has been forced from the outside, and we think that needs to be changed if Greece wants the proper revenues, the intrinsic value from this privatization exercise that really lifts it out of the debt trap. This exercise will not lift it out of the debt trap. It will just sell the assets, it will still be in the debt trap, and the the debt will still run away, and afterwards you will see that there are no assets or no real assets to be sold, and you're still in the debt trap. So what is the sense of this? I have difficulty seeing that. Um, also, there is a capital market reaction to be expected from such a step if you combine Eureka with a smaller haircut. Um, because it would effectively restore the key performance indicators of this country in the rating on all dimensions to an investment grade level, maybe even an A level. Uh, you could expect that the CDS spreads on Greek bonds would drop relatively fast. Now, these CDS spreads dropping uh, would lead to the situation that all those uh, investors who hold the CDS is naked, so who are not covering their own uh, uh, bond investments, but who are speculating on Greece's default, would have to run for the exit. They would have to devise a stop-loss strategy because CDS itself is not such a liquid market that you can quickly sell them, especially when they're falling like a stone. You would have to buy a negatively correlated asset, and that means these investors would be forced to buy Greek bonds to limit their losses, which is a nice way to restore liquidity in the market. That's also why we believe that it would be relatively quick that this country would have access to the markets again. Now, this is giving you an overview of what we are proposing. Um, this slide does not include uh, the somewhat changed architecture that I have introduced to you earlier today uh, when we said we are, we, are, we are effectively redesigning it so that ownership resides with Greece instead of Europe, uh, but it explains uh, the concept. So the European facility, for example, the FSF, buys uh, the assets from the Greek government uh, in, uh, that is bundled in the holding. It then sells those assets. Um, it uses the, per the, the proceeds, uh, Greece uses the proceeds to repay uh, uh, Europe um, and also to give a loan to the European facility um, so that effectively you're ending up with a number of advantages. Now this is the projection of uh, the debt over GDP over the next 15 years if Greece is doing what we are recommending, uh, meaning first do Eureka. The haircut is not actually in those numbers, that would come on top. Uh, it would reduce the debt over GDP in one dramatic step right now, and then it would decrease as the economy is growing and you have a 1% per year repayment scheme, which would be affordable under the, new, uh, under the new numbers that you have there because you have much lower interest payments per year, uh, you have much higher tax revenues because of the growing economy, so you could close that gap. Now, what are the advantages? A, you lift Greece out of the debt trap at once. Second, you're achieving A-level rating. Yes, that's possible. Um, you reduce the CDS spreads to investment grade levels. You create immediate market access by doing that because you force the CDS investors to buy Greek bonds as a stop-loss strategy. Um, you are kick-starting the economy back to growth pretty fast if you do the investment program, and probably it will go faster because just the announcement of such a program would lead to a, uh, to a, a stop of the capital flight and a lot of capital flowing back to the country. You reduce the European taxpayer exposure to Greek debt risk to zero. Uh, you replace it with some asset valuation risk, but which is, according to our calculations, less than 10% of the current credit risk. You're reducing the ECB exposure to Greece to zero, thus restoring the full credibility of the monetary policy in the Eurozone. You're getting a maximum collateral to cover the remaining risk for the European taxpayer. You're optimizing the incentives for Greece for, an, for, to continue the austerity program and to continue the reforms for two reasons, because the more reform Greece is doing, the more investor-friendly Greece is becoming, the higher the, re the privatization revenues will be, and as all surplus goes to Greece, 
there is a big incentive to do that. Um, you also optimize incentives to remove all investment obstacles. You maximize privatization volume because you are pulling all the leverages that are available to get the best price in the market. Um, you are getting a substantial and for sure voluntary contribution from the private sector by the buyback program with no legal fine print in it. You are decisively repelling the speculation against the Eurozone periphery and you are avoiding any form of default for this country and the associated risks with it, especially the risks that are coming from a default or some type of default to the banking system of this country. Much for, for that um, excellent and elegant solution. Uh, I'm possibly not the only person in the room who appreciates the irony of the fact that it's based on a German model, the, um, the Treuhand. Um, maybe I missed it, but <coughs> you, you mentioned the sum of 125 billion euros. Um, where does that come from? Does that in any sense reflect a, an attempt at the valuation of the underlying assets? Because it seems to me that's a very diff difficult um, valuation to make especially given that the Greek state doesn't even know what it owns. Yes, yes. actually it's not a valuation exercise. Uh, we have looked at other valuations that have been done by Greek government, uh, by, uh, by uh, uh, research facilities, etc. And there's a huge uh, range of valuations for the total uh, asset valuation of, of, of Greek assets. And that's ranging from 75 billion to 300 billion. And we are, in regard, with regards to knowing more about these assets, we are not smarter than everybody here in this room. So there's, we, we, what we did not do is a better valuation. What we did do is to say, okay, if it's between 75 and 300 billion, uh, we assume a number that has to be big enough to lift the country out of the debt trap, that is 125 billion, and then we design the whole exercise in such a way that we mitigate the risk of deviating from that. So let's assume it's 300 billion, that is the easy risk, because if, you're, if, the, if you have a surplus, you just paid out to Greece. If it's, say, 75 billion, which we view as a worst case scenario, you would use the buffer in the EFSF from the buyback program to cover that risk. It would still work because Greece's debt would still be reduced by the 125. Uh, and not by then 155 if you include that in the debt reduction. So the debt repayment uh, or the, the, de the debt uh, repurchase program effectively is not for reducing Greek debt by the, by the margin, but it's for creating a risk buffer. That risk buffer is probably some, somewhere in the range of 25 to 30 billion. So assuming that we have only 75 billion in privatization revenues, we would end up with a shortfall of 20 billion, maybe 25. Now, if you follow our repayment program that we are proposing, which is 1% per year over GDP. Uh, you end up under 40% uh, indebtedness of GDP in 2026 when this transaction would be closed. In that circumstance, Greece would be able to repay those 20 billion, including interest, easily. So that is effectively saying we are not knowing it better in terms of valuation, we are just a little bit more creative in terms of risk mitigation. Mr. Carl, thank you very much for this uh, very good presentation. I think that a lot of uh, the things mentioned are just plain common sense. Uh, I know that you have been uh, pushing this uh, proposal since, as you said, May. Uh, are you in uh, talks with the Greek government and are they uh, finding that this uh, could be a solution to the country's uh, problems? Are we closer to, uh, to a Eureka project in Greece now? Well, it's not a secret that I personally and my company has been in close contact with not only the Greek government, but also with a number of Eurozone governments. Um, and the press has been reporting about this. And I do not want to elaborate on, the, on these discussions in detail. However, what I can say is that uh, the general perception is uh, twofold. A, there is a, a political perspective on this which says, can we sell this to the Greek public? Is this something that Greece and the Greek population will be ready to accept to have this type of what some people call a sellout? We do not think that it's a sellout at all. We think that privatization is effectively a way to give these assets back to the Greek people. Uh, these assets effectively are owned by a very inefficient and ineffective state at this, mo at this point in time. That's why they are not productive. This lack of productivity is causing the gap in the performance of this country that led, in effect, to the debt trap. Giving it back 
to the people. And privatizing it, making it more efficient, is effectively a way of ending that. It's also effectively a way of reducing incentives and food for corruption. Uh, so this, we believe, is something that only has to be explained properly to the people. However, the political reaction is that there is this concern. Uh, and we do understand it to a degree. That's also one of the reasons why we slightly changed the construct by saying instead of selling it outright to the FSF, you do an intermediate collateral vehicle and then you do a, an, an asset-backed uh, loan transaction instead, um, which makes it politically easier to accept, but economically it's no difference at all. Now the, um, the reaction is most politicians say it's very attractive, we like it, but it will be difficult to sell. Or some people say, well, I like it, but will the opposition like it? The opposition might say, I like it, but will the government like it? So, so it's more of a slow process of finding out what everybody else is thinking. Um, on the European side, uh, the caution has been in the way that uh, uh, following the same scheme, everybody says, well, this is very nice because it reduces the risk of the European taxpayer and it reduces uh, the risk of the ECB restoring monetary credibility again. Uh, and, uh, you know, Jürgen Stark, who is the uh, chief economist of the ECB was one of the first to uh, make a positive statement in public about Eureka already eight weeks ago when he said this is the way out of the crisis provided that Greece is doing the reforms that Eureka is calling for. Um, now, the, the situation though on the European side is to say, well, we like it, but it has to come from Greece. So uh, it's kind of a, um, uh, the, the, the ball is kind of played between the parties. Nobody wants to pick it up for fear of being um, uh, scolded from the public or from some critical public. Uh, I think there needs to be some courage on the political side uh, to pick up on it um, on both sides. Um, we are optimistic, though, that this happens because it's looking like a mathematical game of exclusion. When you have a mathematical problem, there are different ways to solve it. One way to solve a mathematical problem is to remove all the solutions that do not work, though that in the end only one solution is left on the table. And it looks like that there are not so many solutions left on the table, especially after what happened uh, last, uh, the, the, the night before last night. So we believe that um, the crisis in that sense has a healthy impact on the thought process. So I think the solution is have a referendum on Eureka. Well, um, personally, I have some doubt that the deal as it stands that came out of Brussels will look good in the eye of the Greek public for the simple reason that it puts the country under kind of tutelage or guidance from its European partners for such a long time. Because there is no way to get back to the markets before 2020, um, I just don't see that from the numbers that have been published. Uh, maybe those numbers are wrong, but uh, what, what I read from the details of the numbers is that they look even rather optimistic on many assumptions. Uh, so, in so far, my, my assumption of the Greek public reaction would be that this would be viewed very critical. Uh, I also know that there is, a, there is a part of the Greek public who would also view these proposals very critical. Uh, however, summing it up, I believe that a combination of the Brussels proposals plus enriched by Eureka or something that works like Eureka would be something that would find the approval of a referendum even if you do, some, if you, if you do one in this country. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not sure if we have the time to wait for a referendum. Um, if, we, um, uh, if we want to get the situation under control, I don't think we have two or three months left. Any other questions? Uh, this, look, this looks like a very good plan, but why start with Greece? Why don't you take it to Portugal and Ireland, so some success, and then you can convince the rest of the people. It, it would be easier there, and it possibly would make more sense because they have a smaller risk and they are in less trouble. Let me put it that way. If I would be in talks with a representative of these countries, I could not comment today on this.